الحمد للہ الحمد للہ رب العالمین بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شہلی صدری ویسر لی عمری وللعقدت من لسانی فقو قولی Let me welcome you all for this gathering. In the beginning, I request Brother Abdus Salam to deliver the Khirat. Dear brothers and sisters, I welcome you one and all again for this lecture and I also welcome Dr. C.P. Abhivu Rahman, who is the Director of Unity Health Complex, to be the chairperson of this function. Dear brothers and sisters, the present world is experiencing a lot of conflicts and cla clashes in the name of religions. Hearts have been broken in the name of religion which was, which was supposed to bring us together. At this juncture, a good beginning to close the gap would be by speaking about the similarities rather than the differences. Dr. Zakir Naik does exactly that by speaking on the topic, the similarities between Islam and Christianity. Dr. Z Zakir Naik, as you must be knowing, he is a renowned scholar of the comparative religion. A doctor by profession, he left his profession to spread uh, the message, true message of Islam among the non-believers and less aware Muslims. He has traveled around the world offering lectures on various topics of relevance and has just returned from a hectic tour of Qatar. In the last one year, he has traveled extensively and delivered over 100 public talks in countries such as Singapore, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, UAE, KS, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, USA and UK. 
He is the president of Islamic Research Foundation. He will deliver a lecture on the topic, the similarities between Islam and Christianity. I welcome Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam. Wa rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sabi ajmain. Amma baad. Auz billahi minish shaitanir rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Laqad kafr lazina qalu. Inna allaha huwa al-Masih ibn Marima. Wa qala al-Masih. Ya abani Israel. A abdullah. Rabbi wa rabbakum. Inna huma ishrik billah. Faqad haram malla waliyo al-Jannah. Wa ma wa hunnar. Wa ma li zalimu min al-Sar. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shuhali sadri. ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لساني يفكه كولي دكتور سيبي أبيو الرحمن مي رسبكت الألدرز وان مي دي برزيدن سيسترز اي ويلكم أول أفيو وذي إسلامي جريتينز السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بيس بسم الله المرسي أف الله سبحانه وتعالى بي أون أول أفيو بس فور ذي سيم جريتين which was used by Jesus peace be upon him which is mentioned in the gospel of Luke chapter number 24 verse number 36 where he says in Hebrew Shalom Alaikum which in English also means peace be on you. The topic of this morning's talk is similarities between Islam and Christianity. Islam comes from the root word Salam which means peace. It also means Submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. In short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. And anyone who submits his will to Almighty God, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is called as a Muslim. Many people have the misconception that Islam is a new religion which came into existence 1400 years ago, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was the founder of the religion of Islam. In fact, Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on this earth. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of the religion of Islam, but he is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The glorious Quran says in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 24, there is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner or a guide. The Quran says in Surah Rab, chapter number 13, verse number 7, had, And to every nation have we sent a guide. The glorious Quran says that to every nation, to every people, Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent a messenger and a guide. At the same time, the glorious Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 164, as well as in Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 78, that we narrate to you the story of some of the prophets. Of the others, we don't. That means, the mentioning of some of the prophets have been made in the glorious Quran. Of the others, there is no mention. By name, there are 25 messengers mentioned in the glorious Quran. Like Adam, Noah, Moses, Ishmael, Isaac, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. By name, 25 are mentioned. And Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was born miraculously, without any male intervention, which many modern-day Christians do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. As I mentioned, 25 prophets have been mentioned by name in the glorious Quran. But our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. By name, only 25 are mentioned in the glorious Quran. But all the messengers that came 
before the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, they were only sent for their people. And the complete message which they got was meant for a particular time period. All the messengers that came before Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, they were only meant for their people and the complete message was meant for a particular time period. For example, the glorious Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 49, that we appoint Jesus, peace be upon him, as a messenger to the Bani Israel. Jesus, peace be upon him, came as a messenger only to the children of Israel. And the similar message is given in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 to 6, where it says that Jesus, peace be upon him, tells his 12 disciples that go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews, the Hindus, the Muslims. Jesus, peace be upon him, tells the disciples that go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. Into the city of the Samaritans ye shall enter not, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus, peace be upon him, told the disciples that only go to the children of Israel. Jesus, peace be upon him, himself further says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, where he says that I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus, peace be upon him, came as a messenger only for the Jews, only for the children of Israel, not for the whole of humanity. The Quran says in Surah Ahzab, chapter 33, verse number 40, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَا أَخِي رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمُ النَّبِئِينَ كَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْنَ أَلِيمًا That Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the father of any of your sons, but is a messenger of Allah and is the seal of the prophets. Allah is all-knowing, full of knowledge. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not sent only for the Muslims, or only for the Arabs. The Quran says in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21, verse number 107, it says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to the whole of humanity. The Quran says in Surah Sabah, chapter 34, Verse number 28. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا قَافَةَ لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرُ وَنَّزِيرُ That we have sent thee as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of humanity yet do not know. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger. And he was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs. He was sent for the whole of humanity. And the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned in various world religious scriptures, including the Christian scriptures. If you read in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18, it says that, I shall raise thee up a prophet from among thy brethren, like unto thee, and I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak all that I command him. This is a prophecy of the coming of a prophet, which if you ask the Christian, many will say that this prophecy actually refers to Jesus, peace be upon him. And when you ask them that how does it refer to Jesus, peace be upon him, so they will tell you that the prophecy says, I shall raise thee up a prophet from among thy brethren, like unto thee, like unto Moses, peace be upon him. So if the prophet is like Moses, then it indicates that prophet is the person mentioned in this prophecy. And they say that Jesus and Moses, peace be upon them both, they were alike. And the reason they give is that, see, Moses, peace be upon him, was a prophet of God. Even Jesus, peace be upon him, was a prophet of God. Moses, peace be upon him, was a Jew. Jesus, peace be upon him, was also a Jew. So they give two similarities. And when we ask them, that are these two similarities sufficient to prove that this prophecy indicates only to Jesus, peace be upon him, and they will agree with it. If these two are the only criteria 
for fulfillment of that prophecy than all the prophets mentioned in the Bible that came after Moses, peace be upon him. Like Solomon, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, John, Hosea. All of them were prophets of Almighty God and all of them were Jewish. So all these prophets mentioned after Moses, peace be upon him in the Bible, fulfill these prophecies. In fact, if you analyze, this prophecy of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18, befits no one but the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Because if you analyze Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them both, they both had a natural birth. They had a father as well as a mother. Jesus, peace be upon him, according to the glorious Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse 43 to 47, he was born miraculously, without any male intervention. And the same message is given in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 1, verse number 18, as well as Gospel of Luke, chapter number 1, verse number 35, that Jesus, peace be upon him, was born miraculously. He had no worldly father. So if you analyze, Moses, peace be upon him, was like Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and unlike Jesus, peace be upon him. Both Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they were married and they had children. According to the Bible, Jesus, peace be upon him, he was not married, neither did he have any children. Both Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they had natural deaths. Jesus, peace be upon him, he did not have a natural death. According to the glorious Quran, the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 157 and 58, it says Jesus, peace be upon him, was raised up alive. He did not die. And according to the church, the Bible says that Jesus, peace be upon him, he was crucified on the cross. In both the ways, he did not have a natural death. So Moses, peace be upon him, was unlike Jesus, peace be upon him. And further, if you analyze, Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them both, they were both accepted by the people. The people accepted them. The Gospel of John, chapter number 1, verse number 11 says that when Jesus went, his own did not receive him. Jesus' own people did not receive him. And if you analyze, Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them both, besides being prophets of Almighty God, they were even kings. Kings means they could give a punishment a capital punishment of death to whoever they wanted, whoever committed a crime. Besides being prophets of God, they were even head of states or kings of that world at that particular time. But Jesus, peace be upon him, says, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 18, verse number 36, my kingdom is not of this world. That means Jesus, peace be upon him, was not a worldly king. So if you analyze Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them both, they were alike. But Moses and Jesus, peace be upon them, they were not alike. So this prophecy befits no one better than the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Further the prophecy reads, I shall raise thee up a prophet from among thy brethren. Brethren means relatives. And we know the Jews and the Arabs, we are relatives of each other. And further prophecy says that I shall put my words into his mouth. And we know that whatever revelation our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received, he verbatim repeated that as though words were put in his mouth. So this complete prophecy exactly befits Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. There's a further prophecy mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 12, verse number 29, that the book shall be given to a person who is not learned. And when he will be asked, pray, read this, he will say, I am not learned. And we know when the first revelation that was revealed to beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that from Surah Ikra, Surah Allah, chapter 96, verse number 1, Ikra, when Archangel Gabriel commanded, read, the Prophet said, Ma ana bikari, I am not learned. Exactly verbatim what has been prophesied 
in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse number 12. It's further mentioned in the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. It says, Hikko mamitakim, vikulli muhammadim, zahdudi wa zairai baina Jerusalem. It's a Hebrew quotation, which says that his mouth is more sweet, is altogether lovely. If you analyze Hikko mamitakim, vikulli muhammadim, in Hebrew language, in the Semitic languages, im is a word for respect, plural of respect, im, like Elohim. It's for respect, a plural of respect. Similarly, the word is Muhammad, added with im, peace be upon him, Muhammadim. So actually, even his name is mentioned in the original manuscript. But in translation, they've translated, his mouth is more sweet, he's altogether lovely. Muhammadim, they've translated as altogether lovely. He is my beloved, he is my friend, O daughter of Jerusalem. So by name, even the name of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is there in the original manuscripts of the Bible. Then there may be some Christians who will say that, see, we don't believe in the Old Testament. You know, we give more importance to the New Testament. Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even the New Testament prophesizes the advent of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you read, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John. Chapter number 14, verse number 16. Jesus, peace be upon him, says that I shall ask my father to send you another comforter. Further, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 34. When my father sends the comforter, he shall glorify me. It further mentions the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. For if I depart, shall I send him. Now the word used for comforter in the present Bible that you find is parakletos. It is actually a corrupted form of perikletos. Perikletos actually means one who praises, one who is praiseworthy. Praiseworthy in Arabic is Muhammad, and one who praises in Arabic is Ahmad, Alhamdulillah, both of which were names of the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. As the Quran says in Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse number 6, that Jesus, peace be upon him, the son of Mary, was sent as a messenger to Bani Israel, and he said, I have come to confirm the law that came before me and giving glad tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmad. Peace be upon him. So the Quran says that he will prophesy by name in the law and the gospel. So the original word is parakletos, which means a praiseworthy or one who praises. The corrupted form is parakletos, which is translated as comforter. Even the actual meaning of parakletos is not comforter, it is one who is kind. But irrespective whether it is parakletos or perikletos, whether it's praiseworthy or one who praises, or kind, or comforter, alhamdulillah, all these meaning, they apply very well to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. There may be some Christians who may say, that see, this prophecy actually is indicating to the Holy Spirit. It's not referring to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But if we analyze the prophecy, it says that, it is experienced for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. For if I depart, shall I send him. The criteria for the comforter to come is that Jesus, peace be upon him, should depart. And we know that the Holy Spirit was there before Jesus, peace be upon him. He was even there when Elizabeth gave birth. He was there when Jesus, peace be upon him, was being baptized. So surely, this comforter which the Bible speaks about, doesn't refer to Holy Spirit, because Holy Spirit was already there when Jesus, peace be upon him, was present. And further mention, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, that I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. For he, when the Spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truths. He shall not speak of himself, all that the earth shall he speak. And he shall testify me, he shall glorify me, he shall show you things to come. 
Again, this spirit of truth which the Bible speaks about is about the prophecy of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So if you read the Bible, even the Bible prophesizes the advent of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. There were several revelations sent on the face of the earth. By name, we know four, which are mentioned in the glorious Quran. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Quran. The Torah is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Otherwise, there were several revelations that came on the face of the earth. By name, only four are mentioned in the Quran. But all the revelations that came before the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, they were meant only for a particular group of people. And their complete message was meant only for a particular time period. But the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, was not revealed only for the Muslims or for the Arabs. The Quran says in Surah Ibrahim, Chapter number 14, verse number 52, it says, That here is a message for the humankind. Let them take warning therefrom. Let them know there is only one God. Let the men of understanding take heed. So the last and final revelation Quran was revealed for the whole of humankind. The message repeated in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185, that Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guidance to the whole of humankind and a criteria to judge right from wrong. The Quran says in Surah Al-Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 41, that we have revealed to thee, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the book to instruct humankind. It doesn't say to instruct only the Muslims or the Arabs, but to instruct the whole of humankind. So the last and final revelation of the glorious Quran was revealed for the whole of humanity. Therefore, all the revelations that came before the Quran, since they were only meant for a particular time period, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not think it fit to maintain in its original pure form. The only religious scripture that we have today which has maintained its original form is the glorious Quran. As William Moore, who is one of the strongest critics of Islam, he said, there is no religious scripture which has maintained its pure form, as pure as the glorious Quran, for 12 centuries. This he mentioned 200 years before. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, hadith number seven, he said, that Islam is based on five pillars. First is, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Messenger of Allah. Second is Salah. Third is Zakat. Fourth is Hajj. And fifth is Psalm. The first is that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 177. It's not righteousness that you turn your face to the east or west, but it is righteousness that you believe in Allah. You believe in the year after, life after death. You believe in his books. You believe in the angels and you believe in his messengers as well as the destiny. The glorious Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, it says, Kul ya al kitab Say, O people of the book, say, O Jews and Christian, Ta'ala wila kalmatin sawa'im, bainana bainakum, that come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam, that we associate no partners with Him. Wala yattakhida baaduna baadan arbaaban minnun illa, that we erect not among ourselves, lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawallahu. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. Say we bear witness. 
بِأَنَّ مُسْلِمُونَ That we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the glorious Quran shows you a way how to speak with the Ahl Kitab, with the Jews and Christians. It says, تَعَلَى وِلَا قَلْمِتِنْ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا بَيْنَكُمْ That come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na abuda illa Allah. That we worship none but Allah. And the concept of Almighty God in Islam, the best definition is given in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul huallahu ahad. Say, He is Allah one and only. Allah hussaman. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is begotten. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَوْ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ There is nothing like Him. This is a four-line definition of Almighty God given in the glorious Qur'an. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ عَدْ Say it Allah one and only. Allah who summoned. Allah the absolute and eternal. لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُلَدْ He begets not nor is begotten. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَوْ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ There is nothing like Him. This is a four-line definition. If any candidate claiming to be Almighty God fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that person as Almighty God. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forgive it not that you join partners with Him. And anyone who joins partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has committed a hinyas sin. Allah will forgive it any other sin if he wishes. But joining partners with Allah, Allah will never forgive. The Quran repeats the message in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116. That Allah forgiveth not the sin of joining partners with Him. Anything else, if Allah pleases, He may forgive. But joining of partners, He will never forgive. That means shirk, that is associating partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the greatest sin in Islam. And a similar message is given in the book of Exodus, in the Bible, chapter number 20, verse number 3 and 5, that thou shall have no other God besides me, Almighty God is speaking, thou shall have no other God besides me. Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image of the likeness of anything in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, and in the water under the earth. Thou shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. Similar message is repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 9. That thou shall have none other God beside me. Thou shall make no graven image of anything, of any likeness, of things up in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, and in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. That means making images of Almighty God, doing idol worship, is strictly prohibited in the Bible. And I start my talk, by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran, from Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72, which says, لَقَدْ قَفْرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرِيَمَ That they are doing kuf, they are blaspheming. Those who say that Jesus, peace be upon him, the son of Mary, he is Allah. They are blaspheming those who say that Jesus, son of Mary, claimed divinity, said he is Allah. وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ but said Christ, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, A Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Inna huma yushrik billah. Anyone who associates partners with Allah, Faqad haram Allah wa lil jannah, Allah will make jannah haram for him. Paradise will be forbidden for him. Wa ma wa hunnar, wa ma li zalimin min ansar. And fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. Jesus, peace be upon him, himself said, that in no mushrik billah, anyone who associates partners with Almighty God, fakad haram Allah al jannah, paradise will be forbidden for him, heaven will be forbidden for him. Wama wahun nar, wama lizalibil min antar, and fire shall be his dwelling place, 
And in the year after, he'll have no helpers. But there are certain Christians who say that Jesus peace be upon him. He claimed divinity. He said that he's Almighty God. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is no unequivocal statement, not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus peace be upon him himself says that he's God or where he says worship me. I would like to repeat that if you read the Bible, there is no unequivocal statement, not a single. In the complete Bible, where Jesus, peace be upon him, himself says that he's God or where he says worship me. If any Christian can show me any verse anywhere from the Bible, where Jesus, Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that he's God or where he says worship me, I'm ready to accept Christianity immediately. I'm not speaking on behalf of the other Muslims. Since I'm a student of comparative religion, I've read the Bible. I am ready to put my head on the guillotine. In fact, if you read the Bible, Jesus, peace be upon him, himself said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28. Jesus, peace be upon him, says, My father is greater than I. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, My father is greater than all. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I, with the Spirit of God, cast out devils. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I cast out devils with the finger of God. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. He never claimed divinity. As the glorious Quran says, that anyone who associates partners with Allah, Jesus peace be upon him, said, anyone who associates partners with Allah, paradise will be forbidden for him. And, The glorious Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 110, Qulidullah Avidur Rahman, Ayyamatadu, follow a small husna. Say call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. And there are no less than 99 attributes given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran. Like Rahman, Rahim, Al Hakim, most merciful, most gracious, most wise. No less than 99 different attributes are given in the glorious Quran. And this message is further repeated in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 180, Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 8, and Surah Al Hashar, chapter 15, verse number 24, that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the most beautiful names. But why do we Muslims? We prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic name Allah instead of the English word God. The reason is that Allah is a pure word. The English word God, you can play mischief with that word God. If you add a S to God, it becomes God's plural of God. There's nothing like plural Allah in Islam. Qul huwallahu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. If you add D E S S to God, it becomes goddess, a female god. There is nothing like male Allah or female Allah in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got no gender. If you add a father to God, it becomes Godfather, he's my godfather, he's my guardian. There's nothing like Allah Father or Allah Abba in Islam. Allah is a unique word. If you add a mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There's nothing like Allah Mother or Allah Amin Islam. If you prefix a tin before God, it becomes tin God, meaning a fake God. There's nothing like tin Allah in Islam. That's the reason we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. But when you're speaking to non-Muslims, and people may not understand what is Allah, and if you use the English word God, I've got no objection, but the appropriate word for Allah is Allah itself. God is not the appropriate translation. And the same word Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is mentioned in many religious scriptures, including the Bible. And if you know, in the Old Testament, the word used for God is Elohim. Allah is for God. Him is for plural of respect, Elohim. And if you read the Bible commentary by Reverend Scofield, he writes, Allah as E-L-A-H or alternatively as 
A L A H Allah Allah. So even Reverend Scofield agrees that only the pronunciation they pronounce Allah, we pronounce Allah. The pronunciation is different, but it is the same, one and the same. And further, Jesus Christ peace be upon him when you have put on the cross, according to the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 46. It's also mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 15, verse number 34, that when Jesus, peace be upon him, was put on the cross, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. It is there in every translation of the Bible, whether you read the English translation or Hindi translation, or Malayalam translation, or Kannada translation, this Hebrew phrase, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakhtani is there, and then it is said, so as to say, O oh God, O oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakhtani, O oh God, O oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? I am asking you, the Hebrew statement which Jesus, peace be upon him, said, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakhtani, does it sound similar to, O oh God, O oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? Does it sound similar? Does Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakhtani sound similar to Joha, Joha, why has thou forsaken me? Does Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakhtani sound similar to Jesus, Jesus, peace be upon him, why has thou forsaken me? Now if you translate into Arabic, Arabic, it would read Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani. Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakhtani in Hebrew, in Arabic, Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani. Arabic and Hebrew are sister languages. And you realize it sounds similar. So even Jesus, peace be upon him, when he was put on the cross according to the Bible, he cried out, Allah. Therefore we Muslims, because Allah is a pure word, we prefer calling him by the word Allah instead of the English word God. And that was the same word used by Jesus, peace be upon him. The second pillar is Salah. And in English, People usually translate Salah as prayer. Prayer does not denote the complete meaning of the Arabic word Salah. Because to pray means to ask for help, to beseech. How do you pray in a court of law? You beseech, you ask for help. In our Salah, besides asking for help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are also praising Him and at the same time we receive guidance from Him. Prayer does not denote the complete meaning of Salah. To pray means only to ask for help. In our Salah, besides asking for help, we praise Him and we also receive guidance for Him. If you ask me to explain, I would say that Salah is a sort of programming, a sort of conditioning. But if someone asks, where are you going? And if I say I'm going for programming, it will sound odd. Therefore, I've got no objection if someone uses the word prayer, English word prayer, for explaining Salah. But just let me make a point clear to you that prayer does not denote the complete meaning of the Arabic word Salah. Why do I say that Salah is a sort of programming? Because we are being guided in our Salah. For example, after the Imam, after he reads Surah Fatiha, he may recite Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90 of the glorious Quran, which says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amunu, O you believe, innam al khamru wal maithuru, most certain intoxicants and gambling, or anzabu al azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishthum min amali shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork, first anibullah lukum tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Here we are being guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by Almighty God, that intoxicants, gambling, idol worshipping, fortune telling, these are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. We are being programmed in our salah. We are being guided in our salah. We are being conditioned. The Imam may recite Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2, verse 188, which says that spend not your wealth on vanities and not spend your wealth as a bait to judges in order that you may eat up somebody else's property. The Quran says, that bribing is not allowed in Islam. You are being programmed, you are being conditioned that bribing is wrong. The Quran says in Surah An Kabul, chapter 29, verse 45, Utlu ma uhiya ilayka min al kitabi wa akhnu salata inna salata tanha anil fasha wal munkar. The recite of what we have revealed to thee of the book and establish regular prayers. 
for verily prayers restrain you from shameful and unjust deeds the quran says that prayer restrains you from shameful and unjust deeds and every muslim is supposed to offer salah minimum 5 times a day how for a healthy body we have to have three meals a day similarly for a spiritual soul you should offer salah minimum 5 times a day and the glorious quran says in surah taha chapter number 20 verse number 11 and 12 that when he approached the fire he heard a voice o moses verily i am thy lord put off thy shoes for thou art in the sacred valley of tua almighty god commanded moses to remove his shoes because he was in a sacred place a similar message is given in the bible in the old testament in the book of exodus chapter number 3 verse number 5 it says that draw not nigh hither put off thy shoes from thy feet for the place where thou standest is holy ground the same message is repeated in the book of acts chapter number 7 verse number 33 almighty god tells moses draw not nigh hither put off thy shoes from thy feet for the place where thou standest is holy ground it was a commandment given by allah subhanahu wa taala to prophet moses peace be upon him that in holy ground in sacred place while offering worship remove your shoes our beloved prophet muhammad peace be upon him he gave us permission for both should pray without your footwear but if you are praying with your footwear you should see that the footwear is clean and the prophet said it's mentioned in abu daud volume number 1 in the book of salah chapter number 240 hadith number 652 the prophet said they do the opposite of what the jews do because they always prayed without shoes and sandals it mention abu daud volume number 1 in the book of salah chapter 240 hadith number 653 that shuaib ibn amr on the authority of his father said that his grandfather said that i have seen the prophet pray both barefooted and with sandals that means a muslim can pray without shoes and if he prays with shoes the prophet said you should clean the soul because the hygienic people you want to keep the place of worship clean and the glorious quran says in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 6 that ya ayyuhal ladina amanu o you who believe when you appear for prayers when you prepare yourself for prayers wash your face and your hands up to the elbow rub your head with water and wash your feet up to the ankle doing ablution wudu before we offer salah is compulsory for the muslims and a similar message is given if you read the bible it's mentioned in the book of exodus chapter number 40 verse number 31 and 32 that moses and aaron along with the son they washed their hands and feet thereat and when they entered the temple of congregation they washed before they appeared in front of their lord it's mentioned in acts chapter number 21 verse number 26 that paul along with the men the next day washed and appeared in front of the lord doing ablution is a requirement because we muslims we are hygienic people we want to be clean and besides that it's a mental preparation it's a mental preparation how you have prelim before the finals it's a mental preparation before you appear in front of your lord if christian is a person who follows the teachings of jesus peace be upon him if christian is a person who follows the teachings of jesus peace be upon him then we muslims we are more christian than the christian themselves because we follow more of the bible while offering salah as the bible says we do ablution further our beloved prophet said it's mentioned in sahih bukhari point number 
in the book of Adan, chapter 75, hadith number 692, that Hazrat Anas may Allah be pleased with him. He said that when the companion will offer salah, our shoulders touched with the shoulders of the companions. Our feet touched with the feet of the companion. And the beloved Prophet further said, it's mentioned in Abu Dawood, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 245, hadith number 666, the Prophet said before offering Salah, that straighten your rows, stand shoulder to shoulder, do not leave any gap, close in the gap, and do not leave any opening for the devil. The Prophet wasn't referring to the devil, which you see in the comic strip with two horns and a tail. The Prophet was referring to the devil of racism, of caste, of color. That irrespective whether you are rich or poor, whether you are king or pauper, when you stand for Salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. Irrespective whether you are black or white, brown or yellow, when you stand for Salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. This is the teaching of beloved Prophet. And the best part of Salah is the sujood, is the prostration. And the psychologists tell us that our mind is not directly under our control. Our body is directly under our control. If I want to lift my hand, I can lift my hand. If I want to bring it down, I can bring it down. If I want to take a step forward, I can take a step forward. If I want to take it backwards, I can take it backwards. Body is directly under my control. But the mind keeps on wandering. It's not directly under my control. The psychologists say, in order to humble the mind, you have to humble the body. And there's no better way than putting the highest part of the body, that the forehead, on the lowest part of the ground and then say, Glory be to Allah, the Most Highest. Glory be to Allah, the Most Highest. And the same method has been prescribed even in the Bible. In the Old Testament as well as New Testament. If you read the book of Genesis, chapter number 17, verse number 3, it says that Abraham fell on his face. In the book of Numbers, chapter number 20, verse number 6, Moses and Aaron fell upon their faces. In the book of Joshua, chapter number 5, verse number 14, Joshua fell on his face and did worship. It's mentioned in the New Testament. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, when he goes in the garden of Gethsemane, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 26, verse number 39, it says that Jesus took a few steps forward, fell on his face and prayed to thy Lord. I am asking a question, even an acrobat cannot do better, fall on the face and pray to God than the way we Muslims do. It's the same way, how Jesus, peace be upon him, prayed. So if following the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, makes a person a Christian, then we Muslim are more Christian than the Christians themselves. The third pillar is zakat, which in Arabic, it means to purify, to grow. And every adult Muslim who is rich, who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he should give 2.5% of his saving every lunar year in charity to the poor people. It's compulsory. And the people to whom charity should be given this compulsory charity, zakat, is given in Surah Tawba, chapter number 9, verse number 60. It can be given to the fuqara, to the poor, to the masakin, to the needy, to the amilun, those who are engaged in collecting of zakat, to mu'alla fatu al qulub those whose hearts are coming closer to Islam, to the gharimun, to the debtors, to the riqab, to those who have become slaves, to free the slave. It can be given to the Ibn Sabil, those who is a wayfarer, a person who stands in a foreign land, or fi sabilillah in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If every rich human being in this world gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. Similar message is given in the Bible, if you read. In the first Peters, chapter number 4, verse number 8, it says that give charity, for charity reduces multitudes of sins. Give fervent charity, for with charity you can reduce multitude of sins. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Al-Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 7, it gives the reason for zakat as to prevent the wealth from circulating amongst the rich. The Quran says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 34, that there are people who bury gold and silver 
and do not spend it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Announce to them a grievous penalty that fire will be produced from their wealth, from the hellfire, and with it they will be branded on the day of judgment, on the forehead, on the back and on the flanks. And it will be said to them, this is the wealth you buried, have a taste of the wealth you buried. Holding of wealth is prohibited in the glorious Quran. The fourth pillar is Hajj. It's the pilgrimage that every adult Muslim who has the economic and physical means to perform Hajj should at least perform Hajj once in his lifetime. That's a visit to the holy city of Makkah during Hajj and visit Mina as well as Arafat, etc. And it's the biggest annual gathering. About two and a half million people gather from various parts of the world, from America, from UK, from Singapore, from Malaysia, from India, from Pakistan, from various parts of the world they gather, and the men they wear two pieces of unsewn cloth, preferably white. You cannot identify the person standing next to you, whether he's king or a pauper. It is the best example of universal brotherhood. And the glorious Quran says, in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 13, Ya ayyuha nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shawmaun wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu inna khalmakum inda Allahi atkaakum inna Allahu alimun khabir O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other not that you shall despise each other and the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa the criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not sex, it's not wealth, it's not caste, it's not color, it's taqwa, it's God consciousness, it's piety, it's righteousness. The fifth pillar is psalm, that's fasting, in the month of Ramadan. That every adult Muslim should abstain from having food, drink and sex from sunrise to sunset, the complete lunar month of Ramadan in every lunar year. And the Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 183, that fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people that came before you so that you may learn self-restraint. Fasting has been prescribed to control your desires. Self-restraint. And today the psychology they tell us that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. And a similar message is given. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 17, verse number 21, and the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 9, verse number 29, that people have been commanded to fast. And in the month of Ramadan, fasting helps you to improve your bad deeds. The things that you normally do during the course of life throughout the year, you try and avoid doing the wrong things. And that may remain part of your life. The good thing that you don't do during the year, during Ramadan you want to do. That may become a part of your life. If you can abstain from smoking from sunrise to sunset, you can abstain smoking from the cradle to the grave. If you can abstain from having intoxicants from sunrise to sunset, you can very well abstain from the cradle to the grave. And it's so done that fasting increases the intestinal absorption. These were the five pillars of Islam. But these five pillars do not make up the complete Islam. As the beloved Prophet said, these are five principles, these are five pillars. And any engineer will tell you, any architect will tell you, that if the pillars are strong, then the structure will be strong. So if any human being follows these five pillars correctly, inshallah, his other principles of life also will be strong. The glorious Quran says, in Surah Dhariyat, chapter 51, verse 56. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَاءِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have created the jinn and men, not but to worship me. That means, the jinn and men have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to worship him. The Arabic word used is ibadah. Comes from the root word ab. Ab. In Arabic, ab means slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And... It means a servant. So, Ibadah is a person who does servitude. 
who obeys his master. Anyone who obeys the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's called ibadah. Many people think salah is the only form of ibadah. It's one of the highest form of ibadah. But it's not the only form. Following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also ibadah.